Welcome back to Product 101. This series is all about helping you understand foundational product management skills based on my six years of experience in product. If you're new here, I'm Anthony, a senior PM based out of New York City, and I'm also the founder of Product Career List. I create content about product management, tech, and career growth in general. If that's your jam, make sure to subscribe to my channel and product newsletter. In the last Product 101 video, we covered analytics, what it is, why it's important, and how it actually helps product managers to make data-driven decisions. If you haven't checked out that video yet, click up there and watch it first. In this video, we're building on top of that knowledge to talk about how product managers run experiments, analyze the results, and then track key metrics. I'm gonna break this video down into five different sections. Number one, why experimentation is essential in product management. Number two, the detailed steps to actually running an experiment or A-B test. Number three, common tools that product managers use to track and analyze these tests. And number four, key metrics on how to guide decisions. Finally, number five, I'm gonna go into a real world example to just bring it all together. This is gonna be a deep dive, so definitely grab a notebook if you wanna take notes. So let's start with the why. Experimentation is really the backbone of modern technology companies. Running tests ensure that we're not just guessing when we make changes to the product, but we're instead testing ideas with real users to see what actually works and what doesn't work. Every new feature or change to your product is essentially a hypothesis, a guess that X will lead to Y. So why is this important? Well, product management is all about optimizing trade-offs. Resources you have are finite, your engineering team, your budget, your time overall. By validating ideas through experimentation, you minimize the risk of rolling something out that doesn't work well and you maximize the likelihood of delivering value to your users and your business. You might start off with an MVP for a feature idea. By testing that MVP and seeing if it actually is improving core metrics, you're gonna be able to save a lot of time instead of having built a feature for a really long period of time, shipping it, and then it having not really moved those metrics that are important to your business. For example, let's say that you're considering adding a new feature to your checkout flow. Without testing, you might find out later that the feature actually caused friction for your users, leading to a lower conversion rate overall. Running that test first reduces the risk by ensuring the feature actually delivers value before you roll it out to everyone. Let's now move on to number two, the experimentation process. I'm gonna break this down into five different steps and we'll start with step number one, which is defining your hypothesis. Every experiment starts with a strong hypothesis, which is really a prediction that you're testing to either prove or disprove. A strong hypothesis is specific. It clearly defines what you're testing. It's measurable. The outcome can be easily tracked. And finally, it's actionable. The experiment will actually lead to a decision. For example, let's say that we come up with a hypothesis like adding guest reviews to the search results page will increase our search to booking conversion rate because users will feel more confident in their choices. Notice how this hypothesis is precise and measurable. It's not vague, like making the search results page better will help us. Your hypothesis should clearly state what you're testing, why it matters, and what you expect to actually happen. To create a strong hypothesis, always tie it back to a user problem or behavior that you're trying to address. In this example, surveys that you ran might have shown you as the product manager that users feel uncertain when choosing between different listings on that search results page, prompting this hypothesis. Next is step two, setting your success metrics. This is one of the most critical steps. Before running the test, you want to define how you'll actually measure success. And metrics come in two categories. There are primary metrics, and these track the main goal that you're trying to achieve, like a conversion rate, retention rate, or revenue target. Then there are counter metrics. These are metrics that help you catch unintended side effects, like an increase in the bounce rate or a drop in user satisfaction. For example, if you're testing a change to the checkout flow, your primary metric might be the checkout conversion rate but you'll also want to monitor average order value to ensure that users aren't buying less overall as a result. When choosing metrics, ensure they align with your business goals. So for example, at Airbnb, a higher booking rate might mean more bookings, but less revenue if the average order value is lower. Take all of these factors into account when you're picking your metrics. Next up is step three, designing the experiment. Most product managers will use A-B testing to compare the current version of a feature, also called the control, to a new version, usually called the variant. 
There are other methods like multivariate testing where you're testing multiple changes all at once or sequential testing, which is rolling out changes gradually. But most of the time, teams are just running regular A-B tests. There are some key considerations that you should have when you're designing your experiment. The first is sample size. You're going to want to make sure that you actually have enough users to achieve statistical significance. This prevents making decisions based on random noise from a small number of users. Tools like Optimizely or online calculators can help you estimate the number of users you need to reach StatSig. To provide a short metaphor for why this matters, let's say that you're running an experiment in person at a high school. You want to know which breakfast option is more popular out of pancakes or breakfast burritos. Let's say between 6.45 a.m. and 7 a.m., 30 students walk in and 70% of them pick the pancakes. You're excited, you declare pancakes as the winner, but hold on, those 30 students are just the early risers. Maybe they're athletes or band members who have to be at school early and their preferences just might vary from the rest of the student body. If you stopped there, you'd miss that when the other 470 students arrived, the majority of them actually preferred breakfast burritos. By sampling only a small underrepresentative group, you risk drawing the wrong conclusion. A larger sample size makes sure that you're getting clear, a very accurate picture of the true preferences across the entire school. So the next consideration is defining which user segments will be entered into the experiment. Are you gonna let everyone into the experiment? Is it only new users? Will you exclude any users from the experiment like enterprise users or users on the free tier? Defining this upfront will help provide clarity when you get the results. Finally, you'll want to calculate how long you believe the experiment will actually take. You can base this on the sample size calculations you did before and your current traffic. Once you determine the length of the experiment, you can then notify stakeholders of when you expect to have results. They will be eagerly awaiting the results and you can set expectations properly to help avoid getting asked a ton of questions about the experiment before it's actually over. Next up is step four, actually running the experiment and getting data and results. So once your experiment is live, this is really when the real magic happens. Tools like Amplitude will automatically track user behavior and show you the results. During this phase, you're gonna to want to monitor those counter metrics to ensure no negative impact is arising. You should look for any anomalies. For example, is there a sudden spike in bounce rates tied to your test? You should avoid stopping the test though early even if the results are looking promising, unless there is some anomaly that you need to address. Early results, like a day or two days after you start the test, aren't representative of a full data set. Finally, you're going to want to communicate with your stakeholders. Let them know that the test is running and when to expect results. Okay, now we've arrived at step five, which is analyzing the results and deciding on your next steps. So after the test concludes, you want to look into your data. Look at your primary metric first. Did the variant outperform the control? And if so, by how much? Was there statistical significance? Then you'll want to look at those secondary metrics and any trade-offs. For example, did a higher conversion rate come at the cost of slower page load times? Finally, you'll want to segment the results. For example, did one user group respond more positively than another? Look at mobile versus desktop, paid users versus trialers. Segmentation can help you tailor your approach for different users. So after you look into all this different data, you'll decide one of three different paths for your experiment. Number one, you'll move forward and roll the variant out to 100% of users. This option proves your hypothesis was correct. Number two, you'll iterate with the feature and then retest it. This option means that your hypothesis may still be correct despite a negative metric result, and you'll want to try again with some changes to the feature. And number three, this is where you abandon your idea altogether because your hypothesis was clearly proven wrong. Okay, now let's move to number three, which is discussing different tools that you and your team can use to analyze experiments. By the way, if you're finding value from this video, please drop a like and subscribe. It really helps my channel grow and check out Product Career List, which is in the description below. So there are a couple different types of tools that product managers use throughout an experiment. The first type of tool is actually an experimentation platform. So this is like Optimizely, Google Optimize, or Amplitude Experiment. 
these tools actually help you run the test by deciding which version of the feature users should see, the control or the variant, and then tracking the outcomes. Next are analytical tools like Mixpanel, Amplitude, and Google Analytics. These tools actually help track the entire funnel from beginning to end for your experiment, and it lets you segment your users appropriately. You then might use a visualization tools like Hex, Tableau, Looker, or Data Studio for creating dashboards and segmenting the data. Hex is wildly popular these days for visualization. Finally, you might just run raw SQL to run queries to analyze the data and dig deeper. The right tools depend on your company size, the experiment, and your tech stack, but these categories cover most of your needs. By the way, you won't have to figure this out all by yourself. Your engineering team and data partners will help you with all this stuff. If you're at a super small startup though, this analysis might fall onto you as the PM if no one else is there to help out. So next up is number four, common metrics that PMs track. Every experiment should be tied to a metric that reflects your business goals. So let's go deeper into some of the most common ones across different industries. So within the e-commerce space, there are a couple of big ones. There is conversion rate, which is the percentage of users who make a purchase after visiting the platform. Then there's average order value or AOV. This is where you take revenue earned divided by the number of orders. Finally, there's cart abandonment rate. This is the percentage of users who add items to their cart, but then don't complete their purchase. For SaaS platforms, there's the free to paid conversion rate, which is how many free users convert to paying customers. There's monthly recurring revenue or MRR, which is the total revenue from subscriptions that will repeat every single month. These companies will oftentimes track ARR, which is annual recurring revenue as well. And finally, there's churn rate, the percentage of users who cancel their subscriptions on a monthly basis. For regular consumer apps like YouTube or TikTok, they may look at daily active users, the number of unique users engaging with your app daily. There's also the retention rate. This is the percentage of users who return after a specific time, like a week or a month or three months. And then finally, engagement time. So how long are users spending in the app? Engagement time is especially important for products that earn revenue from advertisements, which is basically all social media apps out there. Okay, now that we've discussed key metrics, let's dive into a real world example with Airbnb. First is the hypothesis. So the team at Airbnb noticed that many users are spending a lot of time on the search results page, but they didn't complete bookings. They hypothesized that adding guest reviews directly onto that search result page would increase bookings. So the hypothesis that they come up with might be displaying guest reviews will increase booking rates by 15% because it reduces uncertainty for users. Next, they'll design the experiment. So there's the control group. This is the standard search results page where users only see the listing title, price, and thumbnail image. Then there's the variant group. This is a modified search results page that includes a quote from one of the reviews of that listing. The primary metric will be the booking conversion rate and a counter metric will be the average order value. We estimate that it'll take two weeks with 1 million users to achieve statistical significance. Let's say that after two weeks, the results show that the booking conversion rate increased by 18% for the variant group. Time spent browsing decreased by 12%, indicating users were making decisions very quickly. And finally, the AOV remained stable, suggesting no negative impact there. The team also then segmented the data. They saw that mobile users saw a 22% increase in bookings, while desktop users only saw a 10% increase. But because there are more mobile users out there, it nets out to a plus 18% change across the board. After looking into the data, the team also saw that listings with better quotes benefited the most, while those with basic quotes saw a minimal change. As for next steps, the team would decide to then fully roll out the feature to 100% of users on desktop and mobile. Then the team will start exploring even more ways to enhance the decision-making process, like adding filters for certain types of sentiments in the reviews. Overall, this test for Airbnb was a success. Experimentation is both an art and a science. By following this structured approach outlined in the video, you can confidently validate ideas, learn from failures, and drive meaningful outcomes for your product. Testing new changes to your product is a way to make smart decisions instead of just guessing what users want and what they need. If you found this lesson valuable, let me know in the comments below. And if you have questions about running your experiments or specific metrics, definitely drop those below and I will respond. 
As always, if you're serious about advancing your product management career, check out the full course I've made on product fundamentals and career strategies. The link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next Product 101 lesson. Thanks.